All right, welcome to another episode of our PML podcast here at Premier Mortgage Lending. Today we have real estate agent Sarah Kotner from Lamakia Realty. Actually, just recently started at Lamakia Realty, coming over from Remax Innovative in Londonderry. Uh, welcome to the PML podcast. Thank you. Great having you on. Um, you seem like you know you're definitely a rock star agent, and Lamakia Realty just picked up an asset. So lucky them. Uh, what's been going on? Oh, let's see. Um, well. I am very excited to start my position there. Um, As for people who don't know, I've been an agent for roughly about three years, and I was really looking for a place that felt like home and that could provide me and my buyers and sellers the best tools, technology, um, different resources. And, you know, I had been following Anthony for a while on social media. And I went to an event uh, a couple weeks ago, and he was just amazing. Like on stage, you could feel the passion that he had for this for real estate. You could care. You could feel how much he cared. Right. About I've heard people. really good things about similar things. And he's actually. super. He's mo- like he's super pumped up. Like energy. He's driven. He's funny. Like yeah. it, he could talk about a subject that most people would think is. Super boring yeah, and make it like, entertaining. Yeah, like, all right, right, let's go. Yeah. But he's not like that. So. He's super passionate yeah. and, uh, you know, kind of brings that passion into his real estate practice mm-hmm. and the people that work under him type. Yep. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, that's really cool. So you got started uh, three years ago, like, right, kind of not right before the pandemic, but before, like within a year before the pandemic? No, it was, um, it was, I want to say it was like two years before that. Oh, it was. So okay. it was, so it was just, just before the housing market started to increase because I purchased my first home by myself in Hooksit, um, which I got for $160,000, <laughs> which you're not going to get nowadays. Yeah, today would be tough. It's yeah. Probably could be sold for 400000 today. <laughs> mm, I don't think that much. No, but, no. Um, but so, yeah, so I, I had lived there for two years, and I was in a position where the market had gone up considerably that I could use the equity that I had in my house to finally cut the cord with my corporate job. Um, and then live off of that for the next six to seven months. While, while you I just up went, real estate. Yeah, I just went full time and gave it everything I had. And that's cool. I was like, that's a smart idea and a, and a smart approach. I mean, because that's like one of the biggest holdups for real estate agents in the beginning is going into that full commission job, full yep. built, full boat. You know, leaving any kind of security blanket that they had at a previous job where they had reoccurring paychecks coming in in that first five to seven, eight month period where you're kind of ramping up and cranking away and just kind of building up your pipeline. And so, you know, that you don't get paid a lot in that first eight months or so. So that's a great idea by you to use that equity in uh, kind of as that security blanket while you built up your business. So, all right. So you got started well before the pandemic Mm -hmm. then kind of built up your business and then the pandemic hit. How did that impact you as an, as a real estate agent? I know, you know, real estate didn't necessarily, we kind of surged in the right direction with the pandemic, but not right away, you know, after it hit. Um, How would you say that impacted your overall business? Um, I think, I mean, for my business, it wasn't great, to be honest, um, but it affected everyone differently. I right. think, you know, depending on what markets you serve. Um, but, you know, I did still have some really good months um, and, you know, didn't help as many people as I wish I had helped the previous year. Um, so did that was like a little, you know, I was tough to swallow at first. Right. But yeah, but I knew that, you know, it wasn't my fault and not no. just the pandemic, but the fact that, you know, Buyers are getting outbid with people who have cash. It's it just tough. a crazy market yeah, right was. now. It was absolutely, and still is for that matter, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, did you, I guess, have to do anything or approach your business differently post-pandemic and even today than that you did prior to when it hit? Like, do you, do you kind of market differently or kind of approach buyers or sellers differently than you would have then, you know, with everything? Or is it sort of um, similar, just a little bit more? I think the only thing that really changed was the way that, I would meet with buyers. Like I really like to meet with them one on one at like Panera or whatever right. and talk to them and just get to know them. Yeah. Build see if that they're a, a good fit for me and I'm a good fit for them mm-hmm. and you know, see what they're looking for. Um with COVID, it was more like, hey, do you want to do a Zoom? Do you want to FaceTime? Right? Because it was you a scary find other time. Ways to like build that rapport and meet, yeah. meet somebody and kind of yeah. get, get in that initial time period where they kind of feel trust and confidence in you. Yeah, but I do I mean I was I've always done handwritten note cards um, to idea. my buyers or my sellers all throughout the year, but especially with COVID, I was like, hey, you know, just want to make sure you're okay. I'm thinking of you. If you need me to drop something off at your door, like 
Let like me know. Mailers work well too. Like when they open an envelope in the mail and open it up and read it, and it's like handwritten from you. Like mm-hmm. they're like, oh, well, that person just took the time to like actually put that together and send it to me in the mail, and that goes a long way. I feel like nowadays because people don't do that. I mean, people don't yeah. even listen to their voicemails nowadays, <laughs> let alone send something in the mail. So um, that's really uh, a smart way to go about it for sure. That that I feel like would be positive and beneficial prior to the pandemic, post pandemic, during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, at any time, some, sending somebody something personalized in the mail is always going to be beneficial. Um, nice. But anything else that you've seen has changed, uh, in real estate since pandemic? Um, in terms of just anything, your business. I mean, I'm very buyer heavy right now in in terms of, you know, between buyer and sellers. That's a good thought for sure. Um, yeah, with the low inventory, I'm sure you've been focused a lot on working with buyers, trying to find them their next house and less and less with, with, sellers unfortunately i'd yeah. say right now yeah um, but i'm sure you've kind of catered to those buyers and, and found a way to serve them better not having nearly as many sellers to kind of cater to and work with um for sure that's probably helped your buyers anyway have mm-hmm. more time from you what did you what did you do when you first got started in those first five to eight months that sort of allowed you to build up your business i know we talked about the mailers and sending out you know personalized mail um personalized letters and envelope mm-hmm. emails per- personalized letters in the mail um anything else that kind of brought more buyers and sellers to your way i mean really i just dedicated you know i i left a full-time you know hourly job and i was like okay i have to give this just as much effort if not more if i want to be successful so that meant going to the office every day eight to five it meant you know making calls sending emails um but they you know taking phone calls at the office speaking to potential clients, right. um, talking, work. Yeah, talking to renters because maybe they didn't think that they could buy, but, you know, when you speak to them and you figure out what their needs are, then you can kind of, you know, guide them. Yeah, better tailor your approach to helping them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some people don't really understand that it's truly more affordable to purchase a home than it is renting. So I just try to take every avenue that I was given um, and just work it the best way that I could. And I'm, I take the approach where I'm very just like passionate and down to earth. I don't push, you know, right. obviously. You don't go the aggressive sales Yeah, pitch. I'm not like that. I've never been like that. Um, I'm sure people appreciate that, especially in, you know, 2022, you know, where people don't want to kind of be sold or kind yeah. of pitched anything. And I mean, rather. don't, don't get me wrong. Like when it comes to negotiations, you I'm a shark on that. Right, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm a shark at the negotiations, but in terms <laughs> of my clients, it's never that, you know, feeling where they'll leave and they're like, oh. Right. You yeah, know, like, make sure you sign this contract or I'm yeah. never going to answer the phone no. again. Type you have thing. to treat right. people like humans. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I bet that has only helped your business, mm-hmm. you know. So essentially what you just said was that you put in all the legwork and did all the things that it takes to be successful in real estate. Um, and that's, you know, I kind of see like today's real estate market in our industry in almost like an opportunistic way that it, this is like a window of opportunity for people like you and me that are willing to do those things and put in that time and that hard work where other people, I mean, our society can't even find people to work at like, you know, the local real retail store or the yeah. local grocery store. I heard on the news yesterday morning that they re, they're actually debating knocking the five day work week down to four days in hopes of getting more people back into the workforce. I was like, I, I, I was baffled. I was speechless. I was like, what is happening right now? We're literally talking about de- like shrinking the work week to get people back to work. Like how pathetic is that? <laughs> but if anything, it's just a great opportunity for people like you and me that are like, yeah, if you guys aren't going to do the work, we'll do it. And we'll just take up more of the margin share and help more buyers and sellers at the end of the day. And they'll get better service for it because would they rather work with somebody that's going to be putting in the hard work day after day that'll work that'll work for them and have their best interest in mind from day one until the day they close and even after or somebody that's not even willing to put the initial hours in you know making some calls and sending out some mailers to kind of help build their business i mean it's an easy decision so obviously we've been working with a lot more buyers due to lack of supply so we've had to tailor our approach to working with those buyers and at the end of the day there's been some things that i know i've picked up and i've talked to you off off camera about that you know buyers definitely should avoid at all costs or certain things that have gone really well and been successful for certain buyers that, you know, would be a generalized kind of universal thing. Like buyers should look into doing these couple things if they're buying a house or not do these few things for buyers. What would you say if you come across or encountered that, you know, would kind of fall into that category? I think the, the biggest thing 
for me is to actually sit down with them and have a conversation about the whole process, right? Because a lot of agents will get caught up in the fact that, oh my God, my phone's ringing, someone wants to go see a house, and then they never truly get to know the buyer and what can they do, what can't they do, what are they looking for, do they have a five-year goal, do they have a 10-year goal, because what they might want now is only what they need for two or three years, right? Right. right. So it's Which really totally diff- change their tailor their approach. You right. Know what I mean, absolutely. Right. So it's really for for me. I just kind of like dig, you know, and try to find out what is their long term goal, right? Um, because if they're let's say they can't get qualified for a single family, but if they need that little bit of extra income, they could get a multifamily. If you don't yeah. talk to them about it, you don't know that maybe you know, in five years, they want to buy more investment properties and they want to use this as rental. Right. You Maybe just it's have a to... starter home they plan to be in for three to five years before mm-hmm. they want to make it an investment property and buy a house of their own to start their family in or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but tailoring your approach to what they specifically want as your client, I can see that being, you know, immensely helpful for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, that, and not only that, but it's the type of help that like kind of is taking it to the next level because a lot of people that are buying houses that don't talk to their real estate agents about that, they get themselves into a house that they're only going to be in for five years. They knew they were only going to be there for a max five years, but they just capped out their budget, found a house at the absolute top ceiling of what they can afford. And at the end of the day, it's maybe not the best house for them because when they go to sell it, will it recoup as much equity? Is it in an area or a geographic area that's going to uh, you know, inflate and increase in value so that when they do sell it in five years, they're going to walk away with a profit or when they go to sell it, are they going to be underwater and make no money back so that they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place finding another house to move to. Yeah. I can see that being huge. It is. And I think, you know, the other thing too is to give them options. When you hear what they say and what their goals are, talk to them about different options. Don't, you know, I have clients who will say, I don't want a condex. I don't want a townhouse. I want a single family home. Okay, well, let's talk about that and what that means for your budget. And right. let's talk about where you want to be in the next couple of years. Can you use a townhome as a starter home? Right. And the way that properties have been appreciating, you know, in three to five years, you'll probably be in a much better space. And then, you know, if your credit goes up or whatnot, then you're in an even better space. Yeah, and every, yeah, every place, everything is a stepping stone to get to where you want to be eventually in life. Like even, you know, with us like everything that we've done along the way has got us to where we are now it didn't just happen overnight right and the same thing you know too with with real estate and and buying that's very true all great points for sure so it kind of sounds like at the end of the day when somebody decides to work with you you're investing in them you know just as much as they're investing in you at the end of the day because i know with how many agents there are, there's thousands of real estate agency, even in New Hampshire, let alone Massachusetts, where the, the number kind of triples. But, um, you know, there's a lot of realtors out there, which granted, it's sort of just the world we live in. I don't blame them, but it, they get focused on really their paycheck at the end of the day and being able to sustain their livelihood and take care of their family. And it becomes less and less about the people they're working with and more and more about themselves. You know, everybody can say that to a degree in some capacity or another, but in real estate, there's a lot of agents and lenders out there, I'm sure that are like that. Um, So it's really cool. And it's a real valuable service that you offer to clients that are thinking about buying or selling their house that, you know, when they choose to work with you, they're they're choosing to work with somebody that's going to be there for them you know, regardless of it, whether it takes two months to close or six months to close. And then, you know, it sounds like you're even available after closing when they're well in the rear view mirror. You know what I mean? So if they answer, you know, if they call you, you're, you'll probably answer the phone almost every time if they just have questions like eight months after they close or maybe just to kind of shoot the breeze with you. Yep. Um, you know, that's a valuable service that isn't I, offered by a lot of agents. Yeah, I always tell people, like my, my goal when I work with clients, I would rather... Obviously, you know, people who have a lot of clients do very well, which is great. And I do have a a good amount of clients, but I would rather work tightly with those clients and get to know them on a personal level. Every one of my clients, by the time we're done and they buy a home is now my friend. Like that's just the way that I approach business. I don't treat people like, you know, oh, you're a transaction on to the next, on to the next, because I just wasn't raised like that. Um, I mean, I was raised by, you know, two old fashioned grandparents and my mom. And it's just, I didn't grow up that way. I grew up that you treat people the way that you would want to be treated. You respect people. 
Um, and I just pour like everything I have into it and into them. So. Yeah, I mean, for you know somebody that's thinking of selling their house or buying a house, I mean, that you can't really ask for much more than that, especially when you add in the fact that like you bring that level of service and dedication to every transaction. And then on top of that, you have the resources available to, you know, also provide the same level of service of, of any like top producing rock star agent out there. And not only New Hampshire and Massachusetts, but anywhere in the country for that matter. Um, and then, you know, even to add on to that, like the media team that we offer with the, the services that they can come out to the house, put together listing videos, matter ports, whatever they need. It just gives you that leverage as a real estate agent with so much competition out there that is kind of like the make it or break it type stuff that like people are going to really decide who to work with based on this, these types of things. Um, so that, that's really cool that you, you know, are really invested into all of your clients that you work with um, and become friends with all of them. That's, you know, I'm sure there's hardly many real estate agents out there that can say that. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, They're like my extended family. Yeah. I don't, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I come from a, a large extent, I mean, large family and it's just, you know, it feels good to have that at the end of the day, knowing you're not just saying buy. Like I, I have one seller, seller slash buyer that we still talk. And she's like, when are you coming up for Chile? And I'm like, <laughs> I know this COVID thing. Right, so right. it's like, that's the, that's the type of relationships that I want to build with people. And, you know, that's how you successfully build a business. It's by the way that you treat people. For sure. It's not by how many houses you sell. And not only that, but you can be a new agent nowadays in this market and, and close 20 transactions in the first year, 30 transactions your next year, and be on the up and up on this trajectory of being super successful. But then all of a sudden, people get their name out, your name gets out there, people find out that you don't really care about people, you just care about your paycheck. And all of a sudden, those 20 to 30 transactions, it doesn't become 40 or 50, it becomes 20, 10, 5. And then all of a sudden, they're finding a new career. So people can make a lot of money and then quickly realize that they can't sustain that life. So the fact that like you're in it for the long run, and you're in it to provide the best possible service, I mean, it only makes me think that you'll ultimately be super successful as a real estate agent because there's not a ton of people out there like that that truly care about people's best interest um, and they're in it to provide the best possible service they can and not necessarily just so that they can make as much money as they can in a short period of time. Because mm -hmm. this is a business where you absolutely can do that, make a lot of money in a short period of time, but the people that are, I know anyway that are all very successful and have been for a long time have taken that approach ex almost exactly where they care about their clients they're invested in every transaction and at the end of the day i mean we work hard obviously and we we deserve to be compensated um so this isn't something i would even recommend but i've had agents you know forego half their commission to make a deal work because it wouldn't have happened for their buyer if they hadn't done that and I feel like you're just the type of person that would do that. And granted, I mean, we work very hard, so you deserve to be compensated. But at the end of the day, if you know a deal is going to fall apart, if you don't do that, it's super nice that the buyer has an agent, you know, that they're working with that will literally forego their compensation so that they can end up being into their new house. Yeah. And I, I have had that situation um, where that happened with a, a seller of mine. Um, but it's not about the money for me. It's never been about the money for me. You know, this is more of an emotional thing for me. And it's right. a long story from when I was a child and to why I'm so passionate, why I love it now. Um, but it's definitely more of an emotional thing for me. And yes, you know, it's hard when you know you worked hard for that. But what really matters is at the end of the day, you did what's best for the client. And if it costs you some money, that's okay. Right. Because they'll remember that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not about how much money you make. It's, you know, over the, the long run, people will re refer you mm -hmm. um, based we'll on how you that. treated them, you know? Um, and and, and again, I don't, I'm not saying I'm gonna, you know, give all my paycheck up, but, well, I'm, but I'm saying that I invest emotionally in people and I've heard, you know, some agents say, you know, don't, don't do that, don't get too right. close to your clients. But when you do that, it's kind of like, they are part of your family and you want to help them, yeah. you know, and for me, it's not like I need the extra $1,200. I'll give it to them. Right. Like just they to, just to too. make like, it, just to make it work. For sure. Yeah. You know, they can tell when somebody's truly, you know, cares at the end of the day and not just kind of saying what they think they want to, they want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool that, uh, that you offer that and that your clients can, you know, know that that service is something they're always going to have when they work with you. 
Um, so uh, let's dive into, the, in this last part here, your transition into Lamaki Realty. I know we talked about it earlier on, coming from Remax. I'm excited about you joining Lamaki. I know that's an awesome team that they have there, and I'm sure that you're, you're only going to grow with them. You know? So what, uh, what are you most excited about joining the Lamaki team from here on out into the future? You know, what uh, do you think will change most with your business? Well, I'm super pumped. Um, I think the, you know, obviously one of the biggest things that's going to change in the business is going to be the growth within myself, just because of the resources, the tools, the training. Um, it's just a very tight knit community. It feels like home, like everybody there wants everyone to succeed. Mm -hmm. No one, I mean, obviously, you know, we're all working at our own business, but no one is like, it's not cutthroat. People right. want to see you succeed. Um, they want all their all their people to be successful. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, in the fact that, like me, I'm not in it for the money. I just want to help people. Right. That's been something that I've always wanted to do, and I feel that, you know, Anthony is the same way. When I saw him on stage, and I was listening to him talk. I'm like, he, he's like a mentor, but cares and wants to help everyone. He doesn't care whether you're with his agency or a different right. one. He just wants to help agents become better agents. And I think part of, you know, the issue with maybe the lack of inventory, I'm not saying this, um, you know, to, to push people's buttons, but I think a lot of it is agents saying to clients, you know, when clients say, well, where am I gonna go? And then you're saying, oh, it's lack of, in you know, there's lack of inventory, but don't worry, we'll find you something, right? You're putting that out in the universe that there's not a lot of houses. You're making these sellers think they're not going to have anywhere to go. Right. Well, if you take that one statement by the 30,000 agents that are in New Hampshire and the 30,000 that are in Massachusetts, give or take, I mean, that might have something to do with it. That's huge. I'm not, I'm not saying point. that that is exactly why. No, but it definitely but, plays a part. Right. It's for a, sure. It's a domino effect. Absolutely is. That's a huge domino effect and super significant. I'm glad you actually brought that up because we we talk about it all the time here. It's kind of, you know, we dig our own holes and put ourselves like in, in underground to start by saying some of these things that had we left them unsaid, you know, the, they, the client would have never even thought about. I usually don't like to talk about finances in the first meeting, right? Because I want to get to know them, for sure. you know, right. with, with obviously trying to understand what they're looking for. Um, but I think that's what people get so focused on is, is the rate. And I've actually had to explain to clients, you know, they'll come to me and they'll say, oh, we're pre-approved through X bank. And I'll, you know, I'll say, okay, that's awesome. Um, but I just want to let you know that you're allowed to do rate shopping. It's, 90 days right without a hit to your credit and you know the benefit of working with somebody local like ian is i can pick up my phone literally the transaction we just close text call he's answering me on the weekends that's the type of lender that you want you don't want someone that's nine to five because guess what when you have yeah. when you have a question they don't care they're no. not there they, right. they i mean i'm dealing with one now it's like they ended up the lender ended up quitting, really? didn't even call me, and I ended up calling him, and he's like, oh, yeah, well, the bank the bank was supposed to follow up with you and call you. I'm like, "Yeah, we're closing in two weeks. That's a perfect example. The bank is supposed to follow. Like, he's the loan officer. Right. It should be him having the accountability towards that transaction yeah. and towards those sellers even and towards those Even if he's buyers. not working there anymore, it's like, do you take pride in what you right. do? Exactly. I mean, if I was in that situation, I'd let at least the client know, hey, you know, I'm sorry something's come up. Um, I've given your file to this person. They're going to take great care of you. Let me know if you need anything. That's a great point. They're yeah. just like, abandon ship. Yeah, I know? mean, that's a phenomenal point because you're absolutely right. I mean, when I work with people, when you send a buyer my way, like, I become invested in them. I speak to them on the phone multiple times. If they're a little bit older, I'll likely meet them face-to-face. -face. If not, anybody that wants to meet face-to-face, -face, I'm happy to. But I'm invested in them. I get to know them, and I have accountability now towards them. They're trusting me with their financing. Now, not only are they trust me with the financing, but I have to, you know, make sure that I provide excellent service and I go to bat with everything I've told you that my team and I are capable of. So I'm advocating for my referral partners. I'm making sure to provide great service, and I'm invested in that that buyer and those that person and that those people. So where a bank, even Rocket Mortgage, for instance, like that you talk to somebody initially and it kind of goes through the chain of different people, you're never going to get the same person on the phone even maybe twice, let alone more than that. So it's like there's no accountability there. And they'll wash their hands of it 
no problem. Where me, like I don't, it's very hard for me to wash my hands of something like that because I'm invested in those people and I don't want to just wash my hands of people. I'll never do that. So it, it, there's a huge difference there for sure. That's one of the talking points that I also use when I'm meeting with buyers when you said, you know, what are some of the, the do's and don'ts? Right. Um, obviously, it's your preference. If you really love your credit union and you don't want to go anywhere else. Some people are stuck. Yeah. Then that's fine. Right. I will take that and run with it. Right. Um, but I do talk to them and let them know, you know, as you as the buyer, we're going to sit down and we're going to flip this for a second. Okay. And this, I do this with my, my purchase and sales, my negotiations as well, because I think it's very helpful and eye opening for them. So let's pretend that you're the seller. Okay. And I'm the buyer and I present a pre-approval to you from this random place online that we know is only online loans. We don't really know anything about them. They're not around here. They have two branches out in California or something like that. Um, or I have the same offer with someone who's local in Salem, Bedford, anywhere in New Hampshire. I'm going to suggest to my seller that they go with that offer. And the reason being is when you do enough transactions in this industry, you get to know what's going to happen with what bank, right? Mm -hmm. It's like like the back of your hand. It happens every single time. Yep. Um, and just explaining that to them and saying, it's not going to you know, hurt your credit. It's going to be valuable to you when we go up to bat with 15 other offers because they're like, oh, hey, I know Ian from PML. Like it we do deals with him yeah. all the time, it right? It does. It actually happens a lot. And it could be the same exact offer, but because they know they can call you at 830 at night mm -hmm. and get you, that's who they're going to choose. Yeah, and great point. And even to add to that, it, it, it can be a lower offer monetarily and still win out due to that exact reason. I've had buyers have their offers accepted because, you know, even though the other offers were 10, 12, 15, even in this last, you know, six months, $30,000 higher, they've gone with our offer because they know that Premier Mortgage Lending can get the job done and close on time, that we usually hit commitment with CTC status or clear to close. And, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, they know they can pick up the phone and call me at any time, figure out what's happening compared to a bank or a credit union where, yeah, it might be 30 grand more for their sellers at the end of the day, but will it even close is what they're, because a lot of seasoned agents are, are doing more and more listings, I feel like. So, um, you know, m the majority, I would say, if you agree of the listings out there in a normal market are from agents that are seasoned and have been doing it a while. So they know the local lenders that are good and that can close on time and the, the kind of the credit unions and banks and even lenders out there that just might be a nightmare and never close. So yeah. they're the ones kind of strain, you know, relaying that to their clients and sellers like, hey, you know, this, is it worth the extra 30 grand? Because to not have that peace of mind that you're actually going to get this check at the end of the day and it's yeah. going to close. And again, I'm not saying, I mean, I know of some very good local credit unions For sure. that are For great sure. to work with. I'm just saying in general, I'm not pointing anyone out specifically. Absolutely but. not. Absolutely. Because there are, I'll even say that right now that there's plenty of credit unions out there that offer great rates. And as, as far as like their clientele that they use for lifetime, like sometimes they can get deals that I can't even match or come close to. And if you can do that, I tell, I was actually just telling a, cl uh, a client an hour ago that if I knew she could get a better deal or she saw a better deal and could realize it and turn it to a reality from another lender to by all means, I tell people all the time, if you can get better deal or say somebody will come to me and say, well, this, this bank has offered me two points, you know, 2.625 or 2.7 where, you know, you're at 299 or three and an eighth. And it's just like, um, go with them. If they're giving you that rate with no points and it's the same, you know, go with them. The thing, the thing too, though, again, I think like, like I said, people get stuck on rate is do they truly understand the fees that are behind that? Yeah. That's right. A that's thing. a whole like nother conversation. Most people shop interest rate and they have yeah, no idea that exactly. really the APR is what matters. And that yeah. has the finance charges rolled into an actual percentage rate, which is, you know, that's huge. I mean, yeah. somebody could offer you a two and a half percent rate even today, which would just be unrealistic. But you know, their, their APR, the APR is four, over four compared to 275, but the APR is 3.3 .3 with us. So, you know what I mean? Like it just, it really depends, but yes, for people out there shopping different mortgage lenders, look at the APR, not the interest rate. Yeah. Great they get point. stuck on the shiny object. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so. so guys, it's been awesome having Sarah Kotner from La Machia Realty on our PML podcast today. Is there anything else you want to finish off with or say, um, you know, as we wrap this up? Um, I just, 
you know, I just want to say thank you to everybody who supported my business, my friends, my family, my past clients. Um, just, you know, this industry is not easy and it takes a lot of determination and grit and it's, it's not easy. Um, but when you're passionate about it and, you know, people recognize that and they say to you, you know, hey, you're doing a great job, you know, we're really proud of you. So that really means a lot to me. Yeah. So I think this is just probably like a big shout out to, to everyone that I've worked with, well, including really nice. my family. That's really nice of you to do. And that's something I would expect from a real estate agent that cares about her clients and kind of invests in people, not, you know, the compensation at the end of the day. So that's really cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, guys, if anybody is looking to sell their house, do it now and call Sarah to get it listed tomorrow <laughs> because you will get more money for that house than you ever thought possible. But no, in honesty, even if you're going to be a buyer this year, reach out to Sarah. She provides a competitive edge and leverage over uh, her competition with other real estate agents and will relay that leverage to you as a buyer over your competitive competition out there with other buyers, which is huge right now. So any leverage you can get, which I'm telling you using somebody like Sarah or Sarah in particular will provide you with that a little bit of leverage that you need to get an offer under contract in this market. Um, do it. Definitely give her a call. So thank you for joining us, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure. Me. Um, and just so people know that are listening, the areas geographically that you work in most in service, pretty much all of New Hampshire. So I'm licensed in both New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Um, I will basically go anywhere from the White Mountains South. Cool. Okay. Cause I have familiarity with the lakes region. Nice. Oh um, yeah. That's right. You had talked about that. Yeah. I love the lakes region. I've lived there for, for a little while. Nice. Um, and then in terms of Massachusetts, I prefer like the Merrimack Valley just because I went to high school, middle school there, so I know that region best. Um, but one thing I won't do is I'll never not go to a town because it's an hour or two away. If right. that's what's best for my client, that's where I go. So again, you know, no matter where you are in New Hampshire or Mass, just you know, reach out and I'd be happy to help. Spoken like a true professional. All <laughs> Thank right. You. Thanks for having or thanks for joining us, Sarah. And Thank you for uh, having me. Absolutely.